Thanks so much to the Royal Society today for this invitation to present about some of um, my laboratory's work on T-cell immunity and how T-cells can protect us from various diseases. So our immune system is a network of cells, tissues and organs that function to fight disease. The immune system can fight us against infection, it can also protect us from cancer. Understanding the immune system and how it works is really important. Vaccines work by activating our immune cells. It activates by training our immune system to respond to pathogens. The immune system can also eliminate cancer cells in the body. It will recognize these malignant cells as being foreign. And also treatments for autoimmune diseases is yet another reason why we need to understand how immune system's working. Needless to say, if we didn't have an immune system, we'd be in a lot of trouble. We'd essentially be locked here in a bubble, unable to prevent ourselves from things that we just come across in our daily lives. So just to give you a bit of a background on a 101 to immunology and the layers of the immune response, there are two major layers. There's innate immunity, which is very rapid and non-specific. For example, if you cut your hand or you stand on a rusty nail and you get that inflammation and that redness straight away, that's an influx of innate immune cells coming to that injured site. Within innate immunity, you will get activation of cells. You will get inflammatory mediators such as cytokines, which you may have heard of. Innate immune cells can just gobble up bacteria, for example. They can just destroy infected cells. And then we have our adaptive immune response. And it's this sort of immune response that vaccination seeks to induce. So here, when you get infected, you will get a stimulation of our lymphocytes in lymphoid organs. And these are our T cells and B cells. And so when you get an infection and a few days later, you feel your lymph nodes swelling up, maybe on the side of your neck. This is the expansion of T cells and B cells that have recognized a part of a pathogen. And they are becoming trained to go on to remove the infectious agent. And what's left behind following pathogen clearance is um, this immune memory, the ability to respond to that pathogen if you see it a second time. There's the innate immune response, which is really nonspecific, but also can be site-specific. For example, if you, you know, if you get an injury on your hand, sometimes the innate response can just deal with it, clear it at the site, but it also then just wants to flag to the um, adaptive immune response. If it cannot clear it, come here, come and have a look what's going on, because you know, we've got something to deal with, and that's when the adaptive immune response will come in. You might first get infected by a virus. Innate immune cells will come in and they will respond to this virus straight away. This will be in a matter of hours. And then activated innate immune cells will traffic to the lymph nodes. These are hubs where B cells and T cells reside and they will activate these T cells and B cells in the lymph nodes. And this is where they will expand to huge degrees and those lymph nodes will start to swell. And then these T cells and B cells, they will go off throughout the body, they'll be in high numbers and they'll be able to clear the pathogen. And once they've removed that pathogen, that's where they'll contract into leaving behind a pool of memory cells. So you'll have an initial exposure to pathogen, a primary immune response, which takes several days. This is your first immune response, and this is the kick-in of adaptive immunity. And then what's left behind, as I mentioned, is populations of memory B cells and memory T cells. If you're exposed to a pathogen a second time around, your secondary immune response here, it's bigger, it's faster, and it's stronger because we've got these trained memory B cells and memory T cells that can recognize that pathogen really quickly and just clear it before you even might show symptoms. Now, what our B cells can do, they produce antibodies, whereas T cells, they can directly kill infected cells. So these are our killer arms of the immune response, and they can also directly kill cancer or transformed cells. What we know is that these memory T cells will always be circulating throughout the body once they've been generated. If you get an infection for the first time, the circulating T cells will be able to rapidly respond, but of course they've got to get there, so they've got to traffic into the site of infection. Of course this takes time. The way that we think about how memory T cells can protect the body, our view really changed on this around 2009 when there was a discovery of a unique population of T cells that specifically live within the tissues, such as the skin or the gut. And these are called tissue resident memory T cells. You have circulating T cells, which can be found in the blood. And then within our peripheral organs, such as the skin, the lung, and the intestine, you have these tissue resident T cells. And these T cells are inherently different. The tissue resident memory T cells that are embedded within those tissues, they're specific for a certain pathogen. So they've responded to that pathogen um, and then they've become memory and then they've been disseminated around the body and they've sort of gone into various tissues. Something we're actually working on is whether they can have what we would call bystander function in addition to this very specific pathogen immunity. You might have um, inflammatory mediators which could sort of non-specifically activate these cells and whether you could try and do that to give you sort of um, tissue 
countrywide protection is something that we're interested in, but that hasn't really been shown at this point. So really, this makes a lot of sense, and nature's really worked this out that location really dictates how good your immune protection is going to be. And so one way to think about it might be like this. If you've had a vaccine that's just boosted up circulating memory T cells, and then you get a virus infection in the skin, for example, by the time it takes for those T cells to traffic into that site of infection, that virus may have already spread throughout the body. It might have disseminated. Whereas if you were to embed a population right at the front line, then you can have rapid control and containment before the virus gets out of hand. So it's now been shown that these TRMs can naturally protect in a whole variety of animal models against reinfection. So if you have previous memory T cells in the skin, for example, and then you see a skin pathogen, you have um, protective immunity against reinfection. We know in patients that a high number of TRM cells correlates with subclinical herpes virus reactivation. That means people who have the virus and it keeps reactivating, but they don't show any symptoms. That correlates with having a high number of these cells that might be controlling that virus. And also a high number of these cells correlates with patients that can naturally control HIV infection. And so vaccines that induce TRM cells, we believe will give superior immune protection. So here is a naive animal, for example, and we've vaccinated with high numbers of circulating T cells or we've vaccinated with TRM cells. And then we've challenged in this case with a skin herpes virus infection. And you can see that when you've got T cells embedded within the skin, you're able to completely prevent disease. And this is mediated by those embedded cells at the front line. Now, something which is more of an emerging area, but there's also been a correlation here of the more TRMs you have, the better outcomes you may have against cancer. Patients with more TRM in the breast have better outcomes against breast cancer. These little kind of different colors here denote all the different immune populations that you would have in a breast cancer biopsy. And these that we've highlighted in red, those are our resident memory T cells. And then if you look at the survival of patients who have more of these cells or less of these cells, you'll see that patients who have more of these TRM cells, they do better. Now we know that these TRM cells are important in a variety of settings. What can we do about it? How can we harness them to protect against disease? In the areas of cancer and infection, we're looking to um, develop new immunotherapeutic strategies to target TRMs to boost their function and boost their numbers to prevent cancer. We're aiming to inform new vaccine strategies which are designed to boost TRM formation and survival for long periods of time within the tissue. And also in the case of autoimmunity, whereby you might have embedded immune cells that are pathogenic in certain settings, we're working out strategies to directly eliminate these T cells in tissues. How do we do this? Well, the most important thing for us is really to try and understand the biology. We're identifying genes, factors, molecules, environmental signals, which really control T cell decisions. Molecules here that control T cell entry into sites, longevity within that site. And we're using um, various um, gene editing approaches to try and edit these T cells to either convert them into TRMs, enhance formation in tissues, or promote their long-term survival. Just to summarize what I've shown you today, it's that immunity can be enhanced by inducing protective populations of tissue resident immune cells, our TRM cells. The design of new therapeutics that induce this population will lead to better outcomes for patients and how these T cells respond differently to, say, environmental stimulation or certain adjuvants, because indeed they have distinct requirements for their generation and survival compared to other populations of T cells. And also, there's certainly not one size fits all when it comes to T cells in tissues. T cells in different tissues have different requirements, which we're trying to understand, so we can have site-specific immunity against certain pathogens. For example, better um, immunity in the liver against malaria, better immunity in the lung against respiratory infections, and so forth. You know, something that's really important is, of course, it's, it's critical to, you know, be translate, translating um, science into new therapeutics, working with industry, that's critically important. But another part, which is, really important is also the basic discovery. That's really what's critical before you start to design new vaccines or put things into clinical trials. You have to understand the basic biology. And that's something that I'm super passionate about. And, some, and that's something which, you know, certainly in Australia, the funding starting to dry up for that sort of research. But it's, it's really critical if we're to keep the pipeline of translation, um, you know, in, within, you know, of new discoveries that are occurring within Australia.